in the book of Ecclesiastes and had a lot of good feedback so far about this book. It's interesting. It's a very different, unique book in the Bible, but it really connects with people, connects with a lot of their inner struggles and, and turmoil and frustrations. And what we've seen so far is that there's this teacher in the book of Ecclesiastes who we are to take as being King Solomon giving his wisdom under the sun. And that's it's a very key phrase, under the sun. It's only for, from the perspective of here on earth. It's not really taking into account what's beyond the sun. And Solomon comes to the conclusion again and again that everything is meaningless under the sun from the perspective of this is all there is, is just life on earth. That it's like, he says, vanity, vapor, Chasing after the wind, the, the Hebrew word he uses is hebel. It's, it's this, you can't clutch it, it's just, it's this vapor that disappears and, and there's this futility, it seems like. And yet this book points to something in that futility, in that vanity and meaninglessness, it points to something beyond the sun. And today we're going to look at a message that it's, I'm calling today's sermon, The Path to Fulfillment. And there's this question, can there be true fulfillment in life, true satisfaction? So Solomon continues in his quest here in chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes. And let's learn from his wisdom under the sun and then see where it ultimately points to. We'll start in verse 12 of chapter 2. He says, Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads while the fools walk in the darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless. For the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had to toil for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all the toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Let's pause and pray. Thank you, Lord, for this chance, this opportunity to turn to you and open our hearts to your word. We ask that you would give us understanding, it would make sense to us, and that your spirit would empower it and lead us to truth, and that you change our lives. You change our thinking and change our lives by your power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so the path to fulfillment. The first point here is abandoned, abandoned dead-end paths. There are a lot of avenues in life by which people seek fulfillment. And as we saw the last couple weeks, Solomon tried them all. He tried pleasure, laughter, wine, 
achievement, money, culture and the arts, sex, power, complete self-indulgence, and he came up empty. We saw last week that there is a form of a logical argument known as a modus tollens, and, and Solomon basically says, if there is any meaning in this life apart from God, here under the sun, I'm going to find it. And then he had access to everything the world had to offer, way more than any of us ever will. And he says, I looked for it, and I didn't find it. And so there's this conclusion, this implication, that therefore there is no meaning in this life apart from God. In verse 12, he says, What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? And he reasons that there won't be any king after him who is wealthier or more wise than he is. He's, he's reached the pinnacle. And he feels, well, it's on me to search this out. Is there any meaning? Is there any fulfillment under the sun? I'm going to explore this because no one after me is going to have a better opportunity than I have right now. And so then also in verse 12, he says, Then I turn my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. He decides to see if there's a way of life that is superior. Is the life of wisdom the best way to go? Or a life of insanity? Or a life of folly or foolishness? Because as we talked about last week, sometimes ignorance is bliss. It can be a lot happier if you don't know too much. He's like, maybe that's the way to go. And, and so he searched it out. He tried it all. And he comes to a conclusion. He says, you know what? Yes, the way of wisdom is better. Just like light is better than darkness. He says, a, a wise person sees, but a foolish person just stumbles around in the dark and so, okay, we're getting somewhere, it feels like. It looks like the teacher here, Solomon, finally has some hope. He has settled on something worthwhile in the world. But then he says, wait, on the other hand, and in verse 15, he says, then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of better to be wise. But then he's like, wait a minute. At the end, it doesn't even matter says, what then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless. And so he's saying, okay, you know, wisdom is good. You'll, you'll have a better life in some ways, even though, yeah, you'll know a lot and there'll, there'll, there'll be some sorrow in knowing more than a fool knows. Um, but it's still better. You see where you're going and you make good decisions. But then he's like, what does it matter in the end? Wise people and foolish people and crazy people will all eventually die. So yes, wisdom seems better than foolishness, but give it enough time and death will be the great equalizer. Each path leads to the same terrible destination. And this really bothers him. Because what good is it to be wise if your final reward is identical to that of the fool? People today will use a phrase to express frustration, dissatisfaction. The phrase is hating life. They'll say things like, ugh, stuck in traffic again on a Monday morning, seriously hating life right now. Hashtag Monday blues. <laughs> and they'll say, can't believe I have to work late again tonight, hating life so much right now. Or I've been studying for this exam for weeks and I still feel completely unprepared. Honestly, I'm just hating life at this point. Well, hating life is nothing new. It looks like the term itself might have originated with Solomon here in Ecclesiastes because in verse 17 he says, So I hated life. <laughs> because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless a chasing after the wind. He saw the complete futility of everything and he ended up in a really dark place. And then he goes down even deeper into this dark hole. In verse 18, he says, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And so he reasons that 
Yes, he's accomplished a lot of great things, but he'll die soon. And everything he has done and accomplished and gained will be passed on to the next king. And he has a sneaking suspicion that whoever that next king is will probably be a fool (laughs) and will ruin everything he has worked for. And you know what? He's not wrong. Because after Solomon died, his son Rehoboam took the throne. And in a matter of weeks, he lost 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel because of some really dumb political moves. The kingdom of Israel was split and was never reunited. And I could just imagine Solomon spinning in his grave. (laughs) My stupid son. (laughs) Except that he expected it. He'd be like, I knew it. I just knew that all that I've done, all I've accomplished is going to be squandered. What a waste. I brought Israel to its greatest height and within weeks of my death, it all fell apart. What was the use? Why did I even try? And maybe you've felt this way. I don't know if you've ever gone back to a home that you lived in years before. It's like, hey, let's drive by that old house I grew up in and, and then been disappointed in some way. What? They painted it that color? What? Look at the lawn. What a mess. They cut down that tree. What were they thinking? And, and just this feeling of, I love that home, and they've kind of ruined it. Or if you've ever managed anything and put a lot of effort into it, built it up, made it something great, but then you go back later and see that whoever took it over after you has mismanaged it, and it's in disarray. They've they've let it all go, and, and a feeling rises up of utter frustration. And here in Ecclesiastes, there's a word for that. It's that word hebel meaninglessness, vanity, vapor, utter futility. What was it all for? And so verse 20, Solomon says, so my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. He's saying, man, I worked so hard and it all came to nothing. Just building sandcastles that will soon be taken over and erased by the waters of time. And he asks in verse 22, what do people get? For all the toil and anxious striving with with which they labor under the sun, all their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. Let's close in prayer. No, no, just kidding. (laughs) No, there is more. That's not the end, (laughs) thankfully. (laughs) The teacher actually finally gets to a conclusion here that isn't completely hopeless. But what he's done is he's laid out all the dead-end paths for us. And he says, look, I have followed each of these trails all the way to the end, and none of them ended up anywhere. They were all dead ends. So take my word for it. I have done the heavy lifting for you. There is nothing down those paths except massive dump truck loads of hating life. And so the teacher resigns himself to a simple idea, and it's the next point, enjoy God's earthly gifts. And he mentions here three things, eating, drinking, and finding fulfillment in work. We see it in verse 24. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. His conclusion is that if all these paths are dead ends and ultimately meaningless, then the only thing left is just to enjoy the simple things. Don't pursue more and more wealth, extra money and possessions. We saw that last week. That came up empty. Don't try to find fulfillment in achievement or self-indulgence like Achievement's great, but don't find your meaning in it. They're all dead ends. His basic idea is eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And that sounds like a very unspiritual view, but he has a concept that there are blessings from God in this life, and he actually brings God into the conversation. So he's not an atheist. 
He's not pretending to be an atheist. He still sees God in there. Verse 24, this too I see is from the hand of God. He's talking about food and drink and work. This is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? And he believes that God has given us enjoyment in this life, even under the sun, which has a lot of problems because there's a curse. We, we looked into this. There's pain, suffering, toil, death. But there are also simple blessings from God. And we should be thankful for them and enjoy them. And Jesus pointed to this, speaking of the blessings that the Heavenly Father gives all people, not just people who believe in him and know him and follow him, but even wicked people. God blesses everyone in certain ways on earth under the sun. And he says it, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 45, speaking of the heavenly father, he says, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And sometimes, well, we understand it here in California. Rain is a good thing. We need it. Um, those people were mainly farmers Jesus was talking to and, or had cattle flocks and they needed rain. And so if God is causing his sun to shine and he's causing rain to fall, those are blessings. And it's not just on good people, but bad people, all people, the blessings of God for everyone on earth. And, and we're told that here under the sun, that those are good things. And Paul says that rich people should be generous and put their hope in God. And I mentioned this last week, 1 Timothy 6.17 who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Like, oh, so God's not just this uh, killjoy wanting you to have a miserable life. If, you, you know, if you're really spiritual, you're going to have a frown on your face and be miserable and never enjoy any pleasure. That's not how God is. He has many blessings for us in our enjoyment. But then we, we're looking at Solomon's logic, who's, who's saying, hey, but keep it simple. Don't keep craving more and more and more. That's a dead end. Enjoy life, but be balanced about it. We see that in Proverbs 30, verse 8 and 9, where it says, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily breads. I mean, don't make me super rich. Don't make me poor. Let me be somewhere in the middle where I have my needs met. And he says, otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? That happens to rich people. I don't need God. And he says, or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. It's like, I don't want either one of those extremes. God, give me my basic needs. And there, there can be a, an enjoyment in that that's good. When Denise and I recently were in Florida visiting our son Jonathan, we were looking for a place to eat. We said, oh, let's look for a sushi place. And Jonathan found something near us that had good reviews. In fact, almost five stars. And the price was reasonable. And it's like, let's go there. But when we got there, it seemed kind of like a dive. Um, not great service. Uh, things seemed disorganized. Uh, not the greatest ambiance, and then we got our glasses of water, and the water tasted bad, and Denise said, you know, let's go. <laughs> and, and I was like, yeah, maybe, but why did this place get such good reviews? Oh, maybe only two people reviewed it, and they're family members of the owners, you know? And I looked it up, and there are almost 500 reviews giving it down the line five stars on the food quality. I'm like, well, let's stay and see. And I took the first bite of a spoonful of their egg flour soup, and I could not believe how good it was. I was like, oh my goodness, this is the best soup I've ever had. And the couple at the table next to me, we hadn't talked to them yet, but they heard me and they're like, I know, right? This is the best soup ever. And each thing, one after another, was so good. It's this hole in a wall place with this amazing chef, this woman that just made incredible food. And... Solomon here would say, enjoy it. That is a gift from God. Enjoy good food. Enjoy good drink. 
have barbecues, get together. God created taste buds. You ever think about that? He could have just made us hungry so we'd eat and stay alive, but he gave us these taste buds that we can enjoy all these different flavors. God gave us eardrums and then gave us music. And if all you believe in is under the sun and if you believe in only evolution and you have no explanation for music, because music does not increase survival. It's purely for enjoyment. Every emotion can be experienced through music. And God gave colors. It helped us be able to discern colors and beauty for our enjoyment. And I believe God enjoys watching you enjoy what he's given. Just like a parent enjoys watching their children laugh as they play, as they ride bikes or swing on swings. And, and it's like, isn't that great watching kids have fun? And, and God has given us things for our enjoyment. And it should cause us to turn to him and thank him. And Solomon says, don't overindulge. Don't look for your meaning in all of this, but enjoy it. Enjoy the simple and good things in life. Get satisfaction from your work. It's good to work and produce. Find ways to enjoy your work. But then we get to verse 26. And it seems like, okay, we've arrived somewhere good here. But then Solomon continues. He says, to the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. And then he says, this too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Because... Again, he acknowledges God and God's blessings and that life tends to go better for those who live to please God. But ultimately, he still says that it's chasing after the wind. Why? Because all of his other conclusions still stand. He still feels it's all ultimately meaningless under the sun, you might as well just find some enjoyment in God's earthly gifts. That's pretty much all there is. But here's the thing. He's still looking at things from the perspective of under the sun. And he has this flawless logic from that vantage point. And it's, it's moving in a good direction. There's a trajectory to his logic, but it stops short because it is const constrained to being under the sun. But it does serve as an arrow pointing to something more. And that something more arrived almost a thousand years after Solomon's time in the person of Jesus Christ. And it brings us to our final point here. And that is, if you're looking for the path to fulfillment, live for heavenly purpose. Something that's beyond what's only under the sun. As Christians, we live in two worlds at the same time. There's the earthly realm, where Solomon's logic holds. Life is just a vapor, but make the best of it. Enjoy God's earthly gifts. But then there's the heavenly realm. Something beyond life under the sun. And we see in Ephesians 2.6, it says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? No longer under the sun, but raised up way beyond the sun, seated with Christ in heavenly places. And because of Christ, we can have a beyond the sun vantage point. And what does that look like? It doesn't completely do away with Solomon's idea to thankfully enjoy God for the gifts he gives to all people, but there is so much more, and it looks a lot different than Solomon's conclusions. It says in Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That sounds a lot different than Ecclesiastes, doesn't it? The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not saying eating and drinking is bad, but the kingdom of God is something beyond that. 
And in it, the Holy Spirit provides righteousness, peace, and joy. That does not sound like hating life anymore. Because there's something beyond life under the sun. It is the kingdom of God. And Jesus said that that kingdom is a spiritual kingdom and that it arrived with him when he came to earth. Jesus ushered into life under the sun something beyond it. Something that is eternal and meaningful and ultimately fulfilling. Righteousness, peace, and joy that mere eating and drinking cannot give you but which come from the Spirit of God. And so food is good, but there is spiritual food that is far greater. John 4, 31 and following, Jesus' disciples were concerned that he hadn't eaten. It says, Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? (laughs) My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Food and drink, great. But there's a greater food that is connected with a relationship with God. Spiritual food that is fulfilling beyond any, any temporary pleasure because it involves a heavenly purpose. It is getting aligned with your heavenly father and learning to follow his lead. It is discovering the purpose for which you have been born and starting to live that out. And I remember that happened to me in college when I was planning to be an engineer and, and uh, Sometimes people had mentioned to me the idea of ministry, and I'm like, ew, I have no interest in that. I have my own plans for my own life, and and yet in college, as the Lord began to work in my life and began to pursue him more, and then I said yes to start serving as a volunteer in a youth ministry. And something very unexpected happened to me as I was doing that. I saw teenagers' lives being transformed by the love and power of God. And as I got to experience not only witnessing that, but being part of it, it felt so fulfilling. There's so much joy in living for a cause greater than myself, greater than making money. And I noticed my science classes in college started feeling a bit empty. And I still loved science because I believed it's the study of how God did things. But I started to suspect that God was leading my heart in a different direction than engineering or science. And it was so much greater, so much more fulfilling. And so food is good, but there's a different kind of food that has to do with living for your heavenly purpose. It says in Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. There's physical bread under the sun, but there's something from above the sun that gives real life. And Jesus called himself the bread of life. John 6, 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And he's not talking about physical hunger and thirst. He's saying your soul will be satisfied if you come to me. You will be fulfilled. The deepest desires and longings of your heart will will be met. In John 7, 37, it says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, voice. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Solomon didn't know about what Jesus had to offer. He's like, well, I guess all we have is food and drink and enjoy your work. Jesus says, I've got food and drink for you. Come to me. It will truly satisfy. It's something spiritual something lasting. And he gives this open invitation. 
Are you thirsty? Have you been following those dead-end paths? And he says, come to me. And I love that it says he said it in a loud voice. He's like, listen, people. I have life for you. I have fulfillment for you. Come to me. He's calling. Are we hearing him? We don't have to hate life like the teacher of Ecclesiastes did. In Christ, our work also has greater meaning. It is no longer endless toil that comes to nothing in the end. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not empty. It's not hebel. It's not meaningless, because if it's in the Lord, if you're following him, like Jesus, you can say, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. Now, by the way, you don't have to be in vocational ministry. Like, I, I'm a pastor. I'm paid to be a pastor. But there are any number of careers, any number of jobs where you can serve the Lord. And your, your work takes on great meaning if you're doing it as worship, as you're doing it for his glory. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, it kind of seems like it's connected to Ecclesiastes, eat, drink, and work. Do it all for the glory of God. Not just for yourself. Do it for something beyond a greater purpose. Colossians 3, 23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Not for human masters or human bosses. We live in two worlds, earth and heaven. And we can enjoy the former even more because of the latter. Because we can have an eternal perspective and it gives more meaning and more enjoyment to life under the sun. Because we now know that life under the sun is not all there is. But we do have a choice to make. Will we keep pursuing dead-end paths that Solomon fully explored and said the answer is not there? Will we simply enjoy God's good gifts and stop there? Or will we live beyond the sun in light of Jesus Christ? Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 15 when in the chapter, that chapter of the Bible, he's talking about the implications of the resurrection of Jesus. He says the resurrection has changed everything. And in verse 32, he says, If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And Paul is saying, you know what? If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead and there's no future resurrection for us, then yeah, Solomon's conclusion in Ecclesiastes is right. Just eat and drink. Tomorrow we die. That's it. But he's saying in this whole chapter, Jesus is alive. And that changes the calculus. It changes everything. Because Jesus was raised, we too will be raised if we have put our faith and hope in him. And because there is the hope of that resurrection and eternal life, Solomon's conclusions are, they're incomplete. And so I urge you, get to know God through Jesus. Pursue a relationship with him. Yes, enjoy his good gifts in this life. He he wants you to, but go for something more that's lasting by pursuing him and his calling on your life. Live for something greater. And Jesus pointed this out in a pretty blunt way when he told a parable about a rich fool who said, you know what? I'm going to build more barns and silos. I'm going to collect more and more. I'm going to store up all this wealth for myself. And he didn't know that he was about to die. And in this parable, Luke 12, 19, this rich fool says, I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain Laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I mean, that's what Solomon said, after all. 
But there's more than just life under the sun. And it says, but God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Jesus says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. And so let's give up our dead end paths. Live for something beyond simple food, drink, and earthly work and seek fulfillment in a relationship with with Jesus. As I was working on the sermon, thinking about dead ends, I remembered about a dead end I experienced uh, when Denise and I were newlyweds. In fact, we were on our honeymoon in Lake Tahoe, and we were going down a trail, and the trail seemed to veer way off, and I thought, ooh, I'm going to take a shortcut. Denise, sensible woman, stayed on the trail. I took this shortcut, and I'm going down the mountain, and I thought, this is great. I'm going to beat her to the bottom by five or ten minutes. But all of a sudden, I came to a spot where there was a cliff, and I could not continue unless I shimmied across a very steep granite rock face 40 or 50 feet up, and it's just rocks at the bottom. And I thought, if I go back, I'll be like 10 or 15 minutes behind her. She'll wonder where I am. And so I thought, I think I can shimmy across this. And I'm on my belly, kind of hands and knees, and trying to go across. And all of a sudden, there's, there's some loose gravel, and I just started to slide. And I am going toward the edge of this cliff, and I'm going off. I know I'm about to go off, and I'm either going to die or I'm going to be crippled for life. I mean, it was, it just seemed hopeless. And I truly believe a miracle happened in that moment. I think of Psalm 91 where it says, God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all their ways. They'll, they'll lift you up lest your foot strike a stone. And as I was sliding, and I'm, a, I'm at the edge, and all of a sudden, I just stopped sliding. It was like, it felt instantaneous. And I can't prove that an angel did that, but all I know is I came very, very close. And I, I just stopped. I somehow got traction. And I was able to shimmy the rest of the way across and get to the bottom and confess to Denise I almost made her a widow on our honeymoon. <laughs> talking about uh, which way is better to live as, as, as wise or as a fool. I was a fool that day. God was gracious to me. But then I think of just that picture that we all, in some way or another, we take our own path. It says in Isaiah 53, we all like sheep have gone astray, turning to our own way. And we all end up at that dead end. We all end up in this situation where we're facing death, we're facing despair, hopelessness. We cannot save ourselves, and we need God to intervene. And I praise God that he intervened and gave me more life. Yeah, I believe he had a purpose for my life. It wasn't time for it to end then. But every single one of us needs really to realize we've hit that dead end. We've come to the end of ourselves, and we need a Savior We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. We don't deserve to be in heaven. But God still loves us, as we sang earlier. I think about the thief on the cross, really the two criminals that were crucified with Jesus, one on either side. And at first, they're both cursing Jesus. And you could say, you know, from Solomon's vantage point, under the sun, there it is. That is meaningless. Two criminals taking their dead end paths that led them to being crucified in the worst form of death. They deserved it, but here's Jesus, an innocent man, suffering the same fate as those fools. That's meaninglessness. It's all meaningless under the sun, but then to realize, no, what was happening there was the greatest thing that ever happened in history with eternal implications for us. And one of those thieves had a spiritual awakening as he was on the cross next to Jesus. 
he realized this is an innocent man. And then he realized more. He, he realized, it's like God opened his eyes to see that Jesus was not just a man, but was the Savior and Lord. And he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked at him and said, this day you will be with me in paradise. It's not just under the sun. There is eternal life. There is hope beyond the sun. And that man found it by the grace of God. And if you would find that too, you have to have that same spiritual awakening. A big part of that is admitting I talk about A, B, and C. Admit, believe, and choose. Admit that you have come to some dead ends. Dead end paths. Abandon those. It's called repentance. It's like, I admit it. I believe that I've been wrong. And then put your faith in Jesus. Believe in him. Just like that criminal on the cross did. He looked to him and put his faith in him. And then choose is if you truly believe in him, then you're, go- you're going to, it's going to affect your life in some way. And for that man, it was a prayer. Jesus, remember me when you go into heaven. And if you put your faith in Jesus, there'll be some response. And I would encourage you in just a moment here, call out to him. Jesus, save me. Remember me. Take me into your presence someday when life under the sun for me is over. And he will give you salvation that he earned for you on that cross. And then for the rest of your days, what an adventure it is to live for a purpose greater than yourself. There is so much fulfillment in that, so much righteousness and joy and peace in that. But come to the end of yourself. Turn away from those dead ends. Realize that you have gotten yourself lost enough. You finally need to ask for directions and be led by God. And I just want to ask you to pray with me right now about this. Would you bow your heads? Father, we come to you today. In Jesus' name, thank you, Jesus, for rescuing us from just life under the sun, for giving us hope. Hope in this life and hope for the future through your resurrection, through the promise of eternal life. Lord, thank you that you give our lives now meaning and purpose. Lord, thank you for your great gifts of enjoyment. Thank you for great food and people who are gifted to make it. Thank you for taste buds, Lord. Thank you that we can see and appreciate beauty, that we can hear and appreciate music. All your blessings. Thank you for birds that sing and and all the beauty of nature. Lord, thank you that beyond all of that, you love us and you have purpose for us. Praise you, God. Would you reach down and rescue us? And anyone that's kind of on the edge of that cliff, ready to go off and, Lord, save them as they call out to you now. And Lord, we just say to you right now that all the things in this life that there are, none of it compares to you. And what we want and need is you. Your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. Thank you, Lord. As the team sings this song, just pour out your heart to God, whatever you need to pray about right now. Lift it up to him. This is my day.
Lord, thank you for being the air we breathe, the bread we eat, <laughs> everything we need, everything that would be fulfillment is found in you. Thank you so much, Lord. Praise you, God. Pray that you bless each one. Thank you that your spirit's been here working and just pray that this, the truth of what we've looked into today be a, a revelation that, that we never forget, that you drill down into us and we would live in the light of Christ beyond the sun with meaning and purpose and fulfillment. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If any of you need prayer for anything at all, there'll be people up here in the sanctuary to pray with you. I really encourage you, if God was working in your heart, uh, keep pursuing. Don't just walk away and go, well, I felt something. Like, hey, God, finish the work you just began in me and, and encourage you to, to come up and pray with someone, have someone pray with you. And then just a reminder before we close, uh, the announcement about that children's ministry training, uh, that this is the last time you get to hear about this announcement. And just so you understand how important it is, uh, if you work with children or teens in our church, you have to be live scanned. And that's going to be a big part. It's not just a training, but everyone's going to get live scanned. Uh, it's state law. And so we're going to do it all at once instead of everyone having to go on their own and get live scanned. So it's a live scanning party and fingers printing and all that fun stuff. And it's mandatory. And, and so please clear your schedule and be here this Saturday, May 4th. And may the 4th be with you. So, no, so, <laughs> so um, let's stand and sing one closing song. God's grace is enough. God bless you all. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. wrestle with a sinner's heart You lead us by still water